Welcome back to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference and powering the good. And we love talking about SIRS. We are here with their executive director, Tyler Hampton. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm doing great. Appreciate you having us on. Well, you are celebrating a milestone, 60 years. And so give us a little bit of history for SIRS. Okay. We, uh, we actually began on November 1st, 1962. That's our charter date. We started out as an organization that uh, provided services to people with intellectual disabilities in a sheltered occupational workshop. Uh, at the time, there weren't many of these workshops around, so a group of women, including uh, Dorothy Wilson, the wife of Kimmons Wilson, got together and raised enough money to begin the first workshop. I think we had seven individuals with three contracts. Uh, today, of course, we're 1,800 people strong and serving all across the lifespan. But at the time, that small, uh, that small seed, that small beginning, started uh, all of this that we have today. Uh, in the 70s, we merged with a company called Mark Housing, which provided residential housing for people with intellectual disabilities. And then we merged with another company that provided um, day services. And the conglomeration of those three became Shelby Residential and Vocational Services, which we shortened to SRBS or SERVs for obvious reasons. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to be celebrating 60 years. And it's a very exciting event in our life to, to celebrate those six decades. Um, you know, we're looking forward to a lot of different events to commemorate it. You've got a beautiful facility. And as you mentioned, it's so much more. And uh, when you look at all the different things you do, go ahead and paint the picture of the different programs and services for SERVs. Okay. Well, our mission is to provide the services that people need to live meaningful lives in their community. So we are very community oriented. Uh, but part of our evolution has included merging with a company that provided children's services called Special Kids. We now call that Serves Kids. And uh, so that gave us the ability to provide services across the lifespan. So we actually provide services from birth and even pre-birth, providing services to family members, parents who are about to become the parents of a child with a disability. Uh, we provide preschool, we have children's therapies, including uh, occupational speech, physical therapy, uh, behavior analysis, and uh, early intervention services. And you know, a lot of these are very important because when children are developing in those early years, it's extremely important that you get these therapies to them, that you give them that chance so that when they age, they'll have a better chance at uh, success in life. Uh, we also provide services to people in uh, high school from age 14 until they graduate. And these are generally pre-employment services, teaching them skills, uh, both soft skills and hard skills they might need to get a job when they get out of high school. Uh, we have a full range of employment services that include um, uh, job consulting, which is meeting with people to determine what they might be good at and what they might enjoy doing. Uh, we develop jobs for people with different um, companies around the city and around the area. We're working collaboratively with about a hundred different employers right now. Uh, and most of them hire multiple individuals. Once somebody goes to work, they realize the potential and they'll hire more people. Um, then we also provide residential services. We have services that range from 24 seven in-home care to just a few hours a day that someone might need someone to come in and fix a meal. Uh, but we also have a range of intermediate care facilities that are like small nursing homes for people with intellectual disabilities. And that's mostly for the more fragile folks. Paint the picture of the facility because uh, we've done a number of events and tours and walk through and you've got a, yeah. a really cool facility that allows individuals to, to learn independent skills and whether that's cooking, making their bed, you've got kind of a music area and therapy area, like you've got a lot of really neat elements to it. Right. 
And we're proud of our building. We moved in in 2012 after a, a capital campaign that raised about $8 million. And um, it was an old bank building that we had renovated. We took a part of it and made it into our learning center. We call it our enhanced learning center. Uh, but yes, it has a full kitchen, including a commercial kitchen, where we can teach people to cook and prepare simple meals. Uh, we have invited people like Master Gardeners and some folks from um, um, Le Col Culinaire to come in and teach how to prepare simple, nutritious meals like, you know, just a bagel and peanut butter or something that's simple to fix that someone can, can fix on the run. Um, and then we have a small theater that's just sort of for fun, uh, but it has movies and uh, we have a popcorn machine and Cokes and, you know, it's the whole experience. And we have a computer room so people can learn some computer skills. Um, lately, we've been using those, you know, for people to communicate with family members. But uh, we have an art room. Uh, we have an, an older participants room that is set, geared more towards softer living. And uh, we have a um, music room that's fully stocked with musical equipment. Uh, and there's a therapy room that has some uh, sensory equipment in it, like lighted columns of water and, and um, sensory like vibrating uh, materials that you can put on your head. So it's, it's, it's really uh, kind of state of the art in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Touch on the ripple effect and the impact, not just for the individuals, but for the families and for the community at large, because you are teaching independence. You're, you're transitioning from, uh, you know, needing services to being a productive citizen. There, there's a lot of really neat kind of underpinnings for what you're doing that have a larger ripple effect for our community and the families. Absolutely. Talk yeah. about some of those. Well, some of them, uh, for instance, in the younger years and even with some of the older adults who might not be able to do certain things um, because of their disability, it allows families a, a time of respite for one thing, when people can come and stay with us. A lot of family members, because we're here, are able to go to work uh, and work in, in the community at a regular job. Um, you know, and it's, it's really a blessing to be able to provide that kind of uh, support to family members. But even the very young children, the preschools, of course, it's just like any other preschool. It gives the parents a chance to be off doing other things. But it's also uh, teaching those children and giving those families a collaborative atmosphere of like-minded peers and professionals who can help them through those early years of adjusting to life with a family member who has a disability. Uh, but we also provide the, the residential services that can give people that peace of mind that says, you know, my, my loved one is cared for, my loved one has support, and I am not on call 24 seven to provide those same services. Uh, it really is helpful for people to be able to live normal lives. Now, the flip side of that is what we want to do is also allow the people that we support an opportunity to also enjoy their community and enjoy that sense of independence. Um, and especially in our employment field, because with employment, what we're doing is uh, allowing people to have jobs, uh, not, not allowing, but helping them to, to get jobs in the community, which gets them a paycheck and some money in their pocket. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, it can help them reduce or even get rid of the social security or Medicaid funding that provides with them. Uh, so it's really been, you know, it's, it's, it's good for everybody. Absolutely. What has the pandemic meant for you all in terms of trying to navigate through and changes and opportunities? Talk about how the pandemic has impacted your efforts. Oh man. <laughs> um, it's just been, it's been crazy from the first, first shutdown to, uh, to today. Uh, when, the, when, when we realized that COVID was heading our way, we started right away um, planning for the time when we were going to all have to go home. 
Uh, we made sure everybody was able to work from home. Our children's services and our employment services developed a uh, telehealth and, and um, telecommunication process so that when we went home, we wouldn't have to stop. And then, um, you know, it, it, it just sort of shut everything down. We are a community-based organization. And so everything that we were doing in the community had to stop. So we had to find other ways for people to communicate with loved ones, to, to hang with mom and dad or sister and brother. Uh, we had to find other activities for people to do. So, um, you know, we, we sort of developed a whole new, not in community kind of mentality for people. But we've tried to get back in the community several times. And with the several surges we've had, we've had to kind of pull back. Our main goal is to care for people. Um, in our residential services, that's a 24 seven service. So we've had to sort of make that our core business because everyone else had family members that could help care for them when we could. But on the, on the flip side, we also had, um, we also had to, to develop times when, um, you know, we could get people into the community in a safe way. Uh, at this point, about 90% of our people are vaccinated. Um, we've had problems with staffing, of course. Everybody in the world's having problems with staffing. So I just thank God for our staff. We have a wonderful staff of, of uh, direct support people who will, when we've had a need, they have actually moved into the home with people who may have had COVID, even though they don't have it themselves and stay with that person until they were over the, their illness. Um, we've had a lot of staff who have just gone above and beyond working two and three shifts at a time. But, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of that the good comes out in people when the times get tough. And our staff have really, really stepped up. They are real heroes. You mentioned the direct support professionals and you've done a lot of advocating on their behalf to try to increase wages. Talk about some of the advocacy work on your end. Okay. Well, I'm a member of TENCO, which is a, our state association for providers like SERVs. And we have been meeting with legislators. We have been talking to uh, advocates, advocate groups in Nashville and other places um, to help them to understand that the work that our direct support professionals do is hard work. This is hard work. It's, it's very responsible work with people who are very vulnerable. And the pay that they have been getting has not been adequate. Uh, because we're tied in with Medicaid in a lot of places, Medicaid rates have to rise in order for our staff to get raises. And, you know, the, the wheels of government work pretty slowly at times. So we haven't always been able to get the raises we need, but the last few years, we've been able to go from um, about $8 an hour to $12.50 average for staff. And although that's still a very low number, we're working to try to add to that. I understand the state has a uh, surplus this year. And I know a lot of people are going to be trying to uh, tap into that, but we're going to be right there with them, <laughs> hopefully in front of the line. Talk about family ties for serves kids. Okay. Uh, family ties was actually the brainchild of our director of children's services, uh, Liz McMahon, uh, now Liz McMahon Krause. But it's, uh, it was launched um, last year and it, it helps parents connect, helps them learn and support each other uh, and builds a more engaging community with the parents and with the kids who have disabilities. Uh, it's actually kind of an extension of our early on program, and it, um, it just allows family members to get together uh, with, with people who are experiencing the same things they are uh, in, in a supportive way. And, uh, you know, they, they talk about things that they have learned as they've, some of them have been, um, have been parents longer than others. And so it kind of helps the younger parents or the newer parents uh, come along with, with an understanding of what life's going to be like. 
you have a number of events and opportunities for the community to get plugged in, including the 25th anniversary of the Bunny Run 5K, and that's Saturday, April 9th at Cancer Survivors Park, which is near the uh, Memphis Botanic Garden. Talk about <clears throat> upcoming events and ways the community can plug in. How can we help include volunteerism and obviously financial <laughs> contributions, but how can we help serves and talk about some of the events we can plug in with? You bet. Well, uh, with the Bunny Run, our 25th one, uh, is actually part of a, I don't want to call it a triathlon, but it's part of three different runs that are being done in collaboration. We're, um, we're working, actually, I've got my notes. It's called the Celebrating Abilities Race Event Series, or CARES. And it's a three-part run, starting with Civitan's Frosty Five, which is February 26. Uh, and then the Harwood Dash for Disabilities on March 19th. And then our run will be on April 9th. So it's the, the sort of the culmination of the three runs. We have been doing this for 25 years and, and you know, the pandemic slowed us down a little. We actually had virtual runs, um, but you know, this year we're hoping we're gonna be face to face and um, it's just great. I mean, I'd say, come on out. There are ways to support us. If you're not a runner, you can go online and register for the run as a spirit runner. My wife and I are spirit runners. <laughs> we don't get out and run the 5K. But, uh, you know, you can support us by going out that way. We have a lot of different events. We have sparkling nights coming up in August, which is our uh, sort of our signature event. And uh, I don't have the date for that right now, but I know it'll be a big event. Uh, hopefully, again, it'll be an in-person event this year. One of the things the pandemic had, had done was forced us to shift to virtual events. Uh, but thanks to our supporters, um, especially John Barziz, I have to mention his name, but because of John, we've been able to uh, pivot and perform these virtual fundraisers with almost the same results financially. Uh, of course, the pandemic's taken a lot out of us fin um, financially. So any support, any, any contributions uh, would be helpful. Um, we do have some volunteer opportunities and you would probably want to call our development director, uh, Jesse Wiley. And, um, you know, you can just dial the 869-7787 number and ask for Jesse Wiley and she can connect you with opportunities. Uh, there's always something to do. Absolutely. Easy ways to plug in for sure. Talk about website, social media. You mentioned the phone number, but where do we go to learn more about Serves and to get involved? Well, there is actually, we have a Facebook page, uh, Serves Facebook. Um, and then we have the www.serves.org. Uh, most of what we connect with is on there. So um, that would be a good starting place. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We do all that stuff. Uh, I'm an old man. So a lot of that is done by development. I don't get into all of that, but um, but they're very, very much into it. Uh, so it's easy to get a hold of us. Absolutely. The website again is serves.org, which is srvs.org. And so yes, Tyler, you, you have an amazing team. Thank you for all you and your amazing team do. Thank you for coming on the show. You bet. Thank you, Jeremy, for your support. Y'all have been great.